And good morning, happy Monday, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is, wherever in the world you are joining us today. I am, of course, your host, Kurt Mercadante. We have another incredible interview today with someone who's disrupting an industry, building an authority brand, creating value for other people, getting value in return. Brian Clayton is our guest today. Brian, thanks so much for joining us today. Hey, thanks for having me on, Kurt. Great to be here. Yeah, so I, I want to introduce you to our audience a bit here. Brian is CEO and co-founder. You can see it on his shirt of Green Pal. Green Pal is an online marketplace that connects homeowners with local lawn care professionals. Green Pal has been called the Uber for lawn care by Entrepreneur Magazine and has more than 100,000 active users completing thousands of transactions per day. Before starting Green Pal, Brian Clayton founded Peachtree Inc., one of the largest landscaping companies in the state of Tennessee, growing it to more than $10 million a year in annual revenue before it was acquired by Lusa Holdings in 2013. Brian, thank you so much for joining us today and, and sharing your wisdom. Hey, my pleasure. Great to be on, man. Thanks for having me on. So so let's, let's talk about um, how you got involved in your journey. And you obviously built a, a large lawn care company. So it's not like you, you jumped in building the Uber of lawn care because you had a thought in your head, but you had never been experienced in the industry. And you, and you see a lot of startups like that, right? I've yeah. never been involved in X, but I have a thought, so I'm going to start it. Can you tell us that journey? And when you started uh, Peachtree, uh, and by the way, Peachtree in Tennessee, I, I, I saw that. And I thought maybe it'd be Georgia. Um, <laughs> you know, did you go into it expecting an exit or did you go into it just to build a lawn care company? Yeah, so 20 years of entrepreneurship in, 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 in 60 seconds. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I, I was drug into entrepreneurship, kicking and screaming by my father uh, when I was in, in high school. He made me mow the neighbor's yard to make some extra cash. And uh, he said, hey, get off your butt. You've got a job to do. <laughs> I just signed you up to go cut the neighbor's grass. And uh, reluctantly, I went over there and mowed the yard. He actually helped me mow it. And uh, But after we got done, we got paid. And that was my favorite part. And, and ever since then, I was hooked on owning my own business, um, entrepreneurship, and just being in charge of my own destiny. And I just stuck with that business uh, all through high school. I, I was mowing yards and all through college, I used it as a way to put myself through, through college. And, you know, by the time I woke up one day, by the time I was 25 years old, I had something like 30 employees. Uh, I had a real business going and I just stuck with that business. And over a 15 year period of time, I built it over to 150 people, got it over $10 million a year in revenue. And so just going from just myself and a push mower to over 150 people, 70, 80 trucks going out every day, I, I learned just through trial and error how to build a business from scratch. And uh, to your to your question on on uh, did I start off with the with the end in mind of thinking I was going to sell that company? Not really. I I just uh, I loved building it. I loved building something bigger than myself. I loved being a part of something that was special. Uh, my fa like my family was that business was the hundred mm -hmm. some odd people that worked for me, and that was just a lot of fun. And that's what kept me going through the ups and downs uh, uh, of building that company. And when I reached the plateau personally, like I had grown it as much as I could, that's when the notion came to me is like, okay, I should probably sell this company and let somebody else bigger take it on and, and try to grow it more. And uh, that's what I did. It took me two years to get that company sold. And when I sold it, I was uh, I was retired. I was 32 years old. I, I didn't have to work anymore. It was a nice thing. It was very liberating. Uh, but it was also, I, I, I learned a lot about myself during that period of time was that I needed to be in the game. I wanted to be back in the game, building something that a lot of my personal joy comes from my businesses. A lot of like just what gets me out of bed in the morning and what causes me to be a better person is, is, is related to whatever business it is I'm working working on. And so the idea for Green Pal was just a real easy one for me. I was solving my own problem. I was solving the problems I saw over the last 15 years of how inefficient the this lawn mowing business works. And uh, I saw what Airbnb and, 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 and Uber and Lyft were doing. And I thought, okay, a platform and an app needs to exist for this industry guy to spent the last 15 years of my life. And I recruited two co-founders and we just went to work. Luckily, we didn't know how hard it was going to be. Uh, luckily, we didn't know we didn't know what we didn't know, and so uh, we were naive to a degree. Uh, but we just started working on on the on the product and on the problem. And here we are, seven years later, we have actually over two hundred thousand people using the platform, and uh, we're going to do twenty million dollars in revenue this year. And so we're we're a seven year overnight success on, on this second one. But you know, that's twenty years of of just starting businesses from scratch and just just 
just you know never giving up and 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 just constantly working on making them better and better. And and, and I want to I want to focus on something you specifically said about uh, something bigger than myself. But before we do, I want to invite anyone joining us live. And by the way, if you're listening to the, the audio version of this next week and you don't join us live, come follow me on Twitter. Come follow me on LinkedIn. We're going to give all of Brian's links, put them in the show notes so you can follow him as well and follow his story. Um, but please, if you're watching live, don't be a lurker. Jump in, share your city, your state, your name, town, where in the world you're joining us from. Comments, questions, agreements, disagreements, whatever it is. Uh, Ross Brooks, by the way, jumps in and says, two, cow found, two co-founders sounds like a great team. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, when you say building a business that's bigger than yourself, you know, some people, they put their head down and they're like, it's all business and that's it. And I'm going, and that sounds really woo woo to me. Something bigger than myself. What is he? Is he like some guru or something? What do you mean by that? Well, so uh, for me, my business is the thing that causes me to level up. It's the thing that causes me to get out of bed in the morning. It's the thing that causes me to do things I necessarily wouldn't want to do. And so uh, for me, just being a part of something that's bigger than just whatever it is I'm doing, it just like that, uh, that responsibility almost causes me to just be a better person, to be a more wise person, to be a more humble person. I just actually just got done uh, reading a book called, it's called A Million Miles in a Thousand Years. And the name of the author escapes me. But one of the, the, the points of that book is that to live an interesting life, you have to live an interesting story. And so for me, I'm reading this book. I'm like, yes, he's right. Yeah. Like to, to, to live an interesting life, you have to have an interesting storyline and kind of be the hero of your story and so on. And, and for me, like my business is the thing that, uh, that, that creates that storyline. And so that's the way it's, it's been for me. Like the last 20 years was that my, my business is the storyline of whatever it is I'm working on. And there's hot and there's, there's ups and downs and there's, and there's like low points and there's high points. And like you as the main character of, of this story is, are kind of like, you know, marauding your way through this and, and are solving problems and are, are like getting your, you know, getting to the mountaintop, you and your team. And like, to me, that made a lot of sense. And so when I say it's like something bigger than myself, it's it's bigger than just what whatever it is I'm working on. It's like I'm creating something that is is benefiting customers, is benefiting stakeholders, is benefiting team members, is creating opportunities and value for those around me. And that's just a like a fun story to be a part of. Yeah, and 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 Brad Burnett, welcome Brad. Thanks for watching. Says purpose is important, but one thing that I, I see with a lot of business owners is right. They get so focused on their purpose and their bells and whistles and features that they forget something that you've brought up many times, which is solving a problem and the specific needs. If you're not making a positive impact and, and serving someone with a need or a want that they have, it doesn't matter how, how wonderful of a shiny object you have. Right. And so when you look at your initial business, peach tree, and now you look at green pal, you know, when I, I grew up in Chicago and there's a limited finite amount of time <laughs> to which you have things growing in your yard. <laughs> right. Mm. Um, and, but there's my brother-in-law ha has a very successful lawn care uh, company up there, but you know, winter time, you know, <laughs> goes way down. Ha a, a majority of their workforce leaves. I don't know what's happening this year, but a lot of times they would leave the country and come back. Um, I guess the question is in a crowded marketplace. And I was going to say, when I moved down to Charleston, moved into the South, then it was a whole new world. It's like, wow. I, you know, the, the amount of, I mean, not only realtors and wedding photographers in a city like Charleston, but lawn care professionals, it's right. Because stuff is just growing, you know, year round in a competitive marketplace, in a crowded marketplace. How did you, with your initial company and now focus on, specifically who you want to serve, which obviously requires knowing specifically who that ideal client or what that client wants to achieve with your product. How, how important was that to you? And, and how did you determine that? Yeah, to your point, you know, you can look at these things from a macro standpoint and like, what is my purpose? What, you know, what, what is the overarching thing that's causing me to get through this? But at the end of the day, it comes down to practical and tactical things, which is who is my customer? And what problems am I solving for them? And how am I making their life easier and better? And why why are they going to do business with me 
over anybody else that they could in the marketplace. And so at the end of the day, that's what a lot of this stuff comes down to. It's like the purpose is like the, the high level, like what's going to get you through the low points, but you have to distill it down to actional, actionable and tactical things. And a lot of that comes down to value proposition. And, you know, the, your value proposition is if, if I'm your ideal prospect, why am I going to do business with you over anybody else? And for, for us at you know, my first business, uh, it took me years and years of trial and error and figuring out what it was that we did better than our competitors and how we did things more reliably and more cost in a more cost effective manner. And, and now with GreenPal, it took us a very, very long time to figure out what exactly is our value proposition. And, you know, funny story about that is when we started off. We thought that we were delivering the cheapest way to get your grass cut. That's what we thought our value proposition was. And, and it wasn't until we started talking to early customers and talking to the, the people that just wanted to try the product out, we realized actually they just wanted somebody to show up on the day when they hired them. Like we're actually delivering reliability. We're de delivering speed and, and price is secondary to that. And so the point of that story is, is that, you know, your value proposition is something that you, you you start off with a set of assumptions, but you really don't know until you talk to your early adopting customers and really understand what it is, the problems you're solving for them and why it is they chose to do business with you over, over your competitors. And then you can really key in on that and let that guide you through how you develop your product, how you craft your copy, uh, how, how, you know, where you focus, where you spend your time, uh, your, you know, all, what few little resources you have, where you, where you allocate those. Like talking to your users, talking to your customers and, and letting that inform your value proposition is, is how you build a successful business in most any industry. This is such an important learning moment here because there's so many people and I work with folks who think they know what their value prop is, think they know what that impact is, but they never talk to their clients to actually find it out. So I have a lot of my clients who they go out and they actually speak to their clients now. I have them go out and ask your clients. And what they find out that positive impact that is most beneficial in the minds of their clients is many times is so far off what they think it is. Right. Um, I have a client who's a bookkeeping client. He found out one of his impacts is he saves marriages because you have <laughs> you have married couples that are one's doing the books and one's doing the operations. It's like, hey, honey, I got to hire three people. Do we have enough? Can, what's the P&L? Oh, I don't know. I'm three weeks behind marital argument. Yep, yep. You know, you, you talked about speed and reliability. It has nothing to do with the type of mowers. You know, right. it has nothing to do with that, the bells and whip, but that positive impact and talking to your clients. And, and, and I, I assume you would, you would agree. Don't just talk to them when it's time to re-up, right? Yeah. Talk to them throughout. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, like as simple as this sounds, like talking to your customers, it sounds pretty simple. It sounds like it's table stakes, but 90% of entrepreneurs don't do it. And I've been guilty of it. You know, when we were first starting, uh, Green Pal, we would obsess over so many things that did not matter, like what our brand uh, mascot looked like and what the color scheme was and how a particular screen looked and and like what the icon looked like. And if the leaf needed to go this way or if the leaf needed to go that way and none of that BS mattered. All, all the, only thing, the only thing that mattered was how we were going to solve the problem of somebody's grass is four feet tall and they want it short and they want to push a button. They want to be able to get it done. That's it. And so a lot of these things, you know, you, you get led astray as a new business owner and, and, and one that, you know, maybe you're naive and, or maybe you're inexperienced. I know I've been that way. And, and uh, it's talking to your customers and, and making it easy for them to talk to you is something that uh, can lead you through uh, those early periods when you really don't know what the hell you're doing. And so for us, like our, our first version of our, of our website and app were so crappy. They were so clunky, so hard to use, but we made it really easy for people to talk to us. We had a little chat bubble on the bottom of every screen and it would hit me up, hit my co-founders up seven days a week, 24 hours a day. You could talk to us. And so you might be out to dinner with your girlfriend on a Sunday night and you'll have to stop and you'll say, oh wait, there's somebody in Denver, Colorado, who their lawn mowing service didn't show up. Let me see what the hell went wrong here. Like that was the first five years of, of this business was constantly listening to the feedback of users, figuring out what went wrong and why and fixing those problems and letting that inform, you know, how we how we continue to build build out the platform. You know, it's, it's just one of those things you wouldn't think you'd have to say. But I've been guilty of it. And it's just one of those things we have to beat into our heads is, is not only talking to your customers, but making it completely frictionless for them to reach you as the CEO, as the founder, it will help.
few years of your life doing the wrong things. Yeah. And like you said, it's not just, it, this isn't just for messaging and branding. It's also for product development. Everything. Uh, yeah, they're a great laboratory. <laughs> Everything. And, and like as the as the business owner, as the CEO, whatever you want to call yourself, a, lo a lot of the times your your only job is what's what's called is, is, is a capital allocator. And like mm -hmm. your only job is to figure out, OK, this is where money's coming from. It could be coming from revenues, could be coming from investors. And then and then you have to figure out how to like make smart bets and allocate that money. And if you're talking to your customers and your users on a continual basis, you're never going to be at a loss for what to do. You know, you know, like what the 10 things are that stink about your service and you know where to spend that money. That's, that's great. I love this discussion. And Chris Stone, by the way, jumps in. Welcome, Chris. This is great insight, guys. Listen to your customers and don't be afraid to make changes based on their feedback. Uh, Daniel Allison jumps in from Spartanburg, South Carolina. He wants to know from Brian, is one of your favorite movies, Can't Buy Me Love? Mowing Lawns is a great path to start the entrepreneurial journey. <laughs> <laughs> He's right. Uh, one thing, one of the beautiful things about the lawn mowing business is, is low barriers to entry. Uh, and also, fundamentally, there's, there's the, the, the principles of creating a successful lawn care company are almost the same as any other business. You know, constantly listening to users, constantly delivering a reliable service at a good price and figuring out how you're going to do that. Like these are principles of any business and the lawn mowing business can teach you how to do that. It's a hard business, though. <laughs> <laughs> when, when you talk about barriers to entry, I remember a few years ago, um, I posted on LinkedIn. I can't remember the exact question, but it was, you know, what's your biggest challenge to starting your own business? And someone came in there and 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 was trying to make a political argument, socioeconomic argument, but said uh, access to capital, and only a certain fraction of humans in the world have access to capital, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Is that true? Because one of the things you like to talk about is about starting a company. You've built multi-million dollar companies without much money. So is it lack of access to capital or is it lack of something else? I, I think I think the, the access to capital is just an easy excuse to not have to get out and do the hard work. I mean, I hate to say that, but um, maybe you might have in your idea that you want to start a business that's just going to take $10 million to start. Well, OK, that's that's great. And, and yeah, maybe nobody's going to give you 10 million bucks. And so therefore you can't start that business. But guess what? There's a dozen other businesses you can start with no money and you can spend five years or 10 years in that business, build a track record for yourself and maybe even put a half a million dollars in the bank. And then you're at a starting point to start the $10 million business. And then you'll be able to attract capital and then you'll be able to convince investors to take a, take a bet on you. So the access to capital is just a, it's a good, easy excuse for people who don't, who are too scared to get into the game. And I mean, that's a, that's a curt answer, but I mean, that's a crass answer, but I mean, it's, it's, my, it's based on my experience. Um, and so I think, you know, anybody can start a lawn mowing business, a home cleaning business, a roofing business, a, 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 a digital marketing business, a social media marketing, but you can start any business with no capital, grind your ass off for five years or 10 years, develop a track record for yourself, put a hundred thousand dollars in the bank or a half million dollars in the bank or a million dollars in the bank. And then you're ready to start the bigger business that might require a lot of capital. Um, this stuff doesn't happen over two years. It doesn't happen over five. It's over a 10, 20, 30 year arc that you do great things. But, you know, business is one of the things that can help you be, make something of yourself. You know, there's a lot of ways to make something of yourself. Luckily for me, I have no talent in anything. And so <laughs> this was the only way for me to make something of myself. And so, you know, you can make something of yourself in business. And a lot of that just boils down to getting started on something that you can do and then developing a track record and, and starting small and then, and then, and then getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and, and I, 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 I like, I think that, uh, that a lot of people don't want to do that because they don't want to be seen as starting from the bottom. Like the life as a grass cutting service guy, lawn care service professional is, is a very humble one and nobody wants to be seen as starting from the bottom. And so, you know, if you can manage your own psychology and get through that over a 10 year period of time, you can become successful just off your own sheer will. It's like, it's like the old country music lyric. Uh, everyone wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. Like you want <laughs> yeah. to go to 10 million, but you don't want to, you don't want to go through that. Uh, yeah. and, and when you, when you talk about that, that, that journey from, from scratch, from zero to 10 million, 
uh, you know, every business goes through those four pit phases versus forming, then storming, then norming and performing. And some get I stuck like in the storming phase, right? And, and it's the storming phase could be maybe it's your branding, maybe it's your marketing. Maybe you grew too fast in the forming phase and, and you didn't charge enough and now you can't afford to, to scale it up and, and those types of things. And, and, and a lot of businesses go through it multiple times. Um, when thinking about that journey, what were some of the storming phases that you went through from zero to 10 million? You know, looking back 20 years, I've, 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 I've been a part of two businesses that got over eight figures, both of them no, with no outside capital and no debt. And so one thing that like sticks out to me that, you know, as I look back is that trying to like st- look at business as, as a video game, almost like if you can think back to old school, super Mario brothers and just, and just think about like 10 levels or 13 levels and just try to look at every level as just one thing by itself that you have to get through. And I I think a lot of new business owners just getting started to, to, to use this silly analogy even further, they're worried about Bowser when they're first getting started. And it's just like, you don't have to worry about Bowser. That's level 10. You just got to throw up the flag on level one. Just get through level one, and that might be a thousand dollars a month in revenue. It might be it might be a thousand your first hundred bucks, whatever that is. Just get through level one, and then get through level two, which is maybe your first ten thousand, and then get through level three, which figure out how you're gonna get your first hundred thousand a month. And if you can just look at at, at the the game of business as a video game, and just try to like segment it down into little levels that you're gonna chew you're gonna chew your way through. And then that's how you kind of ease your way through over over a three, four, five, ten year period of time to build a business that that gets to ten million dollars in revenue. Because the things you have to do in a ten million dollar business are very different than the things you have to do in a five hundred thousand dollar a year business. And the weird thing is, is that in a, a, a two hundred fifty thousand dollar a year business is much harder to run than a ten million dollar a year business. Uh, it's because you don't have the systems, you don't have the team, you don't have the processes, you don't have the budget, you don't have the experience. You're trying to figure out all these things yourself from, you know, through trial and error. So that is almost to a degree harder, but don't even worry about eight figures. Just try to get to your first million. And then when you get to your first million, you're going to realize, well, shoot, I just got here through just sheer hustle and will. I don't know how to get to 5 million. Well, that's okay. Let's look at what we're doing. Let's look at what works. Let's build some processes. Let's build some systems. Let's read some books. Let's talk to some people who have done it. Let's watch some podcasts like this one. Let's, let's, let's turn off Yellowstone and let's turn on YouTube and, and let's watch a bunch of boring podcasts for three hours every night. And guess what? We'll, we'll figure it out. But if you can look at it as, as, as small levels over a 10 year period of time, that that's how you get to eight figures. And then hopefully nine. Yeah. And I, 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 can't, I couldn't help but thinking, depending on what state you're in, there's about three states in the U.S. that it's more like Frogger, right? <laughs> 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 but we won't yeah, go there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So let's get you, into you, hey, We're house. showing our age. We're, you and I are showing our age uh, with, with these video game references. Yeah, I know. I know. I know. I always think of, I don't know if you're a Seinfeld person, but I always think of Frogger. Uh, yeah. They George never, episode. I mean, at least they remade Super Mario Brothers a bunch. They never remade Frogger. <laughs> It's under, <laughs> my, my kids are just, they love it. Super Mario Brothers. And now they have this the Lego set where you actually get it. And like the Legos have this thing where you jump with the Lego and you oh, actually wow. get points that way. It's crazy. <laughs> yeah. So they're more into it than I ever was. But um, Green Pal, what is it? How does it work? And, uh, you know, let us know how you, kind of the journey of is your ideal customer the end user or is your ideal customer lawn care professionals and getting them on the platform. Cause I know Uber, you know, for a while their, their target market actually wasn't the end user, the drivers, it was getting, or uh, the, the riders, it was getting more drivers and that was their big push. Um, so can you tell us about that trajectory there? Yeah. So in a sentence, green pal is the easiest way in the world to get your grass cut. You know, if, if you need to get your lawn mowed, even if it's four feet tall, rather than calling around on Craigslist or Facebook, yeah. leaving a bunch of voicemails, you can just hire somebody at push of a button. And so that's what GreenPal is. That's what GreenPal does. Um, it's a true multi-sided marketplace, meaning we we have almost two customers. We have homeowners that need this service done, and we have service providers that make a living mowing grass, and we give them the platform and the tools to do that. And so to your point, yeah, we we really have two customers. And so what we say is, you know, we offer a nice convenience to homeowners. Uh, we give them a high five uh, almost 
but service providers, we give a hug. We materially make their life better. We give them a platform to where they plug in and they can make material income on top of the technology we've built. And that's really why we do what we do. It's really why I get out of bed. It's because that's how we have the greatest impact. I mean, we, we, we have hundreds of stories of lawn care service uh, operator that maybe only had five customers and they, they plugged in the green power. And after their first year, they had a hundred. And, and it's like, and then we have what, we have a Facebook group that we invite all of these people into and they share, they share stories like, Hey, look at this new, this new truck and trailer I just bought. Thank you. Thanks to green pal or green pal helped me save my home out of foreclosure. Or we have, we have a single mother in Atlanta who, uh, who was doing hair and she and her son started a lawn mowing business. And now she has six people working for her wow. all on green pal. And so like, this is a lot of fun. I, I you know, I, I've been at this seven years. My co-founders and I have been working our butts off on this thing for seven years. Um, but I haven't worked a day in seven years because this is what I want to do. This is my best idea. And like building the technology that enables hardworking people to make material income and have access to the American dream is, is just a lot of fun. And so that's who I really kind of empathize with. Yes, yeah, it's, it's nice to offer a convenience to people and like solve a problem, especially when people are in a jam and their lawn mowing service left them hanging. But really changing people's lives is, is why my team and I do what we do. That's incredible. And, and, you know, you're so focused on creating value that that's how, you know, a lot of people, when we go back to that argument of lack of access to capital, it's like, if you can create value for another human being, that human being is going to give you value in return. And so whether it's creating value by helping people become business owners who were never business owners before, or then providing a, an easy solution for end users. And I love how you said that, that the end user, you give a high five to, right. but you give a right. hug to the service provider. Right. And, and knowing that, I, I assume there's a lot of, of entrepreneurs or startups who are trying to build the Uber of whatever, who perhaps lose sight of that goal and are so focused on the end user, which is important that perhaps they forget about how to get those people in. I, I, there's, there's a startup around here that's, that's regional. I don't know how they're doing, but they're, they're kind of an Uber for uh, barbers and hair professionals that they'll come to your house. Um, and you know, you got to get those people in, in the door. Yeah. For, we could, we, you and I both could use that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so to, to your point, one, one question we get a lot is, well, how do you keep people from cutting you out of the transaction? How do you keep mm. people? And the fancy word for that is, is platform disintermediation. Mm. And so, and, and so that, that's a question I get a lot. And, and I do some, some mentoring and coaching for, for other uh, tech entrepreneurs. This is just as a hobby that are trying to start marketplaces like what we have. And the, the answer I have for that is that if people are cutting you out of, of the transaction, it's not happening to you. It's happening for you because you that's an indicator to you as the as the as the, as the entrepreneur that you're not adding enough value. You're 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 taking out more value out of the equation than you're adding, because if you are frankly adding more value, they wouldn't want to cut you out. And so this this has been a problem for us in the early days. And, and it was it was because our product stunk. We didn't have the tools. We didn't have. We didn't solve the problems we needed to solve. We didn't. We didn't listen to to people when they were screaming and hollering for a certain thing. And we didn't build that thing. And like, so to, that's a that's an indicator to help you figure out what it is you need to be working on and where you're not adding enough value and how you need to punch that up. And uh, uh, I think that's why like business is one of the most worthwhile things you can do because it's a constant feedback machine to let you know where you stink and let you know where you need to work on, 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 on fixing problems. And so the disintermediation is something that, that we look at and always have used as a, as a metric to help us understand, okay, we thought we had a great product in this aspect, but we actually don't. And this is where we need to focus resources. And that's where like the capital allocation comes into play as the owner, as the, as the entrepreneur, as a CEO, you're applicate, you're, you're allocating resources and capital and you're letting that, that, things like this intermediation and feedback guide you as to where you want to focus. When you start out, is it, is it, is it hard to track that disintermediation? Dis intermediation because the only way you can is if someone tells you directly, right, which they're unlikely yeah. to do, is it just looking at patterns and, and, yeah. and piecing those patterns together? When you're starting out, it's hard to track anything. I mean, you're yeah. just wet finger in the air. 
you're just doing as much as you can. It's like pushing on a string. You're just trying to hustle something together. We ended our first year with less than 50 customers. Now we have over 200,000. But, um, you know, in those days, in the early days, you're trying to listen to every single customer, every single user to, to give you insight as to where you need to focus. And to your point, uh, yeah, it's a lot of it is just listening. And so what would happen a lot is like, hey, you know, I hired this guy and uh, and he told me he didn't want to use green pound anymore. So I started paying him cash and then he disappeared. Do you have any other guys for us? And like, so, so inevitably the, the case of the of the disappearing lawn guy just happens. And so they always ended up coming back to us. And so hmm. that was kind of our our uh, indicator as to as the when and why and how this was happening and then we would we would use uh, an old school uh framework that uh toyota uses in in uh lean manufacturing we would ask why five times okay well why did this person get hung out to dry well the vendor uh didn't show up well, why didn't the vendor show up well because they quit using green pal well why did they quit using green pal well because as it turns out we only got them two customers in an entire month Okay, well, we have a marketing problem in 37209. This is a marketing problem. This is not a product problem. It's not It's not a people just suck problem. It's, it's a marketing problem. So asking why five times for every <laughs> single problem, you can get to the root cause of it and figure out where, where you need to focus. So Green Pal is on a growth trajectory and 2020 hits. And a lot of interesting things going on <laughs> in 2020. There are certain industries, you know, you, you, you talk, it, it's hit or miss. I'll talk to some people, how's 2020? It's a growth year. It's incredible. I mean, certainly you look at like an Amazon, you look at, at Tesla, you look at some of these companies, uh, and there's a lot of companies that are growing. Uh, even some restaurants have figured out how to adapt and maybe not grow, but, but maybe they're taking some other people's market share who refuse to adapt. The lawn care industry, just anecdotally, as I look around, everyone's still getting their lawns done. You know, um, and I've heard a lot of home service contractors too. It's like, I feel like people were at home looking around, sitting, working from their dining room table. And they're like, I hate the paint color here. We got to paint, <laughs> you know, might as well get the plumbing fixed this time. How has the COVID era impacted Green Pal for good or for bad? You know, I think a lot of it comes down to luck. You know, if you had a, if you had a restaurant, you know, this was going to be a tough, tough year for you. A lot of things related to travel, maybe um, events, concerts. Mm -hmm. I mean, it doesn't matter how good an entrepreneur you are and how skilled you are. If you were in the concert business, nobody wants to watch a concert on Zoom. And so uh, it's tough. I mean, I'm not going to sit here and and say that, you know, you can hustle your way out of some some of these situations. Um, to your point, a lot of restaurant owners have figured out ways to adapt and evolve. And so I think there's a lot of a lot of this is an opportunity to take your business down to the sticks and rebuild it from the inside out and become like the last man or woman standing. Uh, mm -hmm. If you look at it from from that that paradigm for us, we flat out, we're just lucky. You know, uh, the grass is still going to grow it's a safety and a health concern if the damn grass gets six feet tall around your home. And so for us, it's been an up year. I mean, we've doubled this year and, you know, but, but so have Uber eats, Postmates, DoorDash, Instacart, you know, they, they've all had a huge year and we've kind of ridden that wave as well. And through contactless ordering is a big part of, of how we've kind of uh, modified our value proposition somewhat mm -hmm. to, to punch that up. You don't have to meet with somebody. You can just order it. Um, and, and luckily, you know, the economy is kind of held a little stable. And so, and so nobody, you know, people haven't gone completely broke yet. Uh, and so for us, it's, it's been a, it's been an up year and in, in, in large part, because we built a stable, sustainable business that's profitable as default alive, no matter what happened, no matter how bad it got, we weren't going to die because we built a debt-free sustainable business. We have, we don't have any outside stakeholders. So no matter what happened, we were going to survive. But but on the other, so that that was one piece of it. And then on the other piece of it, we just flat out got lucky. You know, we got lucky we weren't in the in the in the crosshairs of this thing. If if yeah. if like COVID was spread through the shoring of grass, and you yeah. couldn't cut grass, we it would it would have really sucked for us. And that's yeah, like right. the analogy to the concert guys. You know, like so a lot of this came down to luck for us. But for us, luckily we've had a we've had a great year. There, there's, you mentioned like an Uber Eats or an Instacart. And 
I've had a number of discussions with people who are like, yeah, I, I, I never used it before. And we've had these discussions that really there's no reason I shouldn't have used it before. Like why weren't these growing leaps and bounds even before the pandemic and the pandemic kind of caused, you know, these behavioral mutations where it's like, now I have to use it and thank God it's there. But then you look at it and it's like, it should have, it should, but it's a different enough behavior outside of our conditioning that ordering Outback Steakhouse on your phone is just like, it's not part of your conditioning and your regular programming. So it took a pandemic to, 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 to force behavioral change. Is the nature of lawn care, you know, ordering my food here so that it can be delivered from Publix or Dominic's or whatever your local, you know, Harris Teeter, your stores are, is that, how do you compare the two from a behavioral aspect? Is it, is it less of a behavioral change for someone to order lawn care through an app versus groceries? Great question. So a lot of people ask, well, who are your competitors? Are you worried about Angie's List or Home Advisor or the other guys in, uh, that are doing uh, like a Uber for lawn mowing type thing? I tell them, no, that's the problem. Like yeah. our our compet our competition is the status quo. It's just the stodgy, doing it the old way, the hard way, because you don't really know or you don't want to you don't want to change. That's still our competition. And and you know, like you look at the keyboard on your laptop, there are like. 20 keyboards that are more efficient that have been invented that are easier to type on quicker to type on but none of them will get adoption because of of everybody's using this one keyboard and so that exists for every for every industry and and a lot of these uh you know DoorDash Uber Eats they just have overcome that through through cap, through capital just throwing hundreds of millions of dollars at the at the problem to get distribution to slowly chew their way through to become ubiquitous you know we haven't taken that path we've bootstrapped our way through so we we don't have that huge budget to, to just go spend on a bunch of ads and so uh so so for us one thing that helps us is when when these like tidal waves occur um it helps recondition users to understand that you can do it the easier way, you know, like, uh, you know, okay, the, it's, it's not as big a leap to order a lawn mowing service uh, from an app. If you've already used Instacart, you've used DoorDash, you've mm -hmm. used Uber Eats, it's not as big as a leap now. And now you, you, you say, yeah, okay, I'll just use Green Pal to get my grass cut. And so for us, it helps us in, in, in sort of a knock on effect. So this reconditioning like user behavior to, to do things the easy way through a digital interface um, COVID has, has, has helped us because people are now looking for, they're forced to look for ways to, to do things in a contactless way. And so, and so it's been beneficial to us, but you can rewind all the way back, you know, 20 years ago, we, you know, you, we can thank companies like Amazon and Facebook just for training people to use interfaces just to do e-commerce, right? Hmm. Like, yeah. you know, it's like 20 years ago, you didn't even think about interacting with a screen to book a flight, you know, you, or, or 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 to or to order, you know, some your your books. So those those companies conditioned users to to think, okay, well, at least I can interact with a screen to get something done. Now the second wave is okay. This this in person, uh, physical kind of commerce that occurs, service based commerce. Now the big boys like Uber and 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 DoorDash and Postmates. They are now reconditioning people to understand that you can use apps to get these things done. And we're kind of riding that tidal wave. So it's, it's, it's helped us to in a large extent. By the way, you've mentioned contactless a number of times. And I, it's, it's, it's interesting seeing how businesses use that term. And like what you described is true contactless, right? You order it on your phone. They come in. You don't have to touch the person <laughs> right? that's doing your right. lawn care. But I see some fast food places talk about contactless ordering. And we'll sit there and you'll watch 18 people touch the bag on the, what, how are you using that term? It, it's yeah. become such a catcher. I, I digress, but it's, it's funny yeah. how what you described is true contactless. But if you go to Chick-fil-A, I'm watching the assembly line of people touch everything. Um, what are you going to do? You know, at, le at least, at least these days you don't have to walk around and, with your long guy and hand them cash, which yeah, right. is crazy as it sounds like 75% of, of lawn mowing business is still conducted in that manner of leaving cash under the mat of, of handing somebody a paper check. Uh, you know, it's, it's just silly. And so we're like, that is the biggest hurdle for us is overcoming that status quo and distributing yeah. our way through that, that behavior. That's uh, that's interesting. It reminds me of Netflix said their biggest competitor is your sleep. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, it's, it's behavioral change. Uh, at least you're, you're, you're probably doing it to the betterment. Uh, I'm not sure if Netflix is. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. What, what, what's about your business do you love the most? You know, for me, the, the thing I love about business is it just, it, it is the thing that enables me to, to make something bigger and better of myself and to create opportunities for people around me. Like it's a, it's just a beautiful thing. Like without that, like, why am I even here? Why am I getting out of bed in the morning? Like, like business is the thing that causes me to, to just, just continue to work on something, continue to just get better, continue to try to create opportunities for my team and for the people that use our products. Like there's no other thing that exists that would, that would bring all of this, th these good positive things in my life. And that's what, that's what I love about it. You know, and, and it, it's like, I'm like the hardest working, laziest person you'll ever meet. So I kind of <laughs> have to have that forcing function mm -hmm. and the, you know, the business that, that, that I'm a part of and the goals that we've set out for ourselves and the objectives we laid out and the, and the milestones that we know we have to knock down. It's the, it's like the river of life for me that causes me to keep moving forward. I, I love that. And, and uh, I'm obsessed with water and flow and yeah. flowing forward. And, and I, I like to tell my clients that a lot of the, I call them hustle and grind pornographers, would have you believe that if you're the water in the river and you see a boulder in the middle of the river, you're supposed to grab that river and headbutt it until your head is bloody. No. And then headbutt it some more when no. you could just, and, and when you said hard, yeah. hardest working lazy person, that describes it to a T. It's yeah. not the yin or the yang. It's the yin and the yang, right? Trying That's to right. trying to move forward. So I love that. That's right. Yeah, and like the, I, I love the metaphor too because it's true. And and you know if you if you if you're taking a hike through the woods and and there is a, a there's a stream that's dammed up, uh, that stream is not going to be very uh, pleasant to hang around. It's going to have <laughs> algae in it, maybe trash and beer cans are going to have collected in it. It's going to have a bunch of sticks. It's going to stink. So you don't want to hang around that. It's not moving. You want to you want to be a part of the stream that's got the white, you know, the white rapids and it's moving and you can hear it like and it smells fresh. And like so that's just an analogy for life for me. And business is the vehicle that causes that for me. That's incredible that. And by the way, Kevin Jaskolka says asking why five times one of the best tools ever. So uh, give some kudos to that. Ross asked a question that, that you probably got to. But he says regarding value early on, how did you attack the journey of understanding what value really was? for the customer end user. I mean, one of the biggest things you talked about was going out and actually having discussions and asking the customers, was there anything else? Any other tools? Yeah, you know, th like there's, there's no, this stuff isn't complicated. If, if you are working on something and you really like, we we have spent two or three months developing features specifically for like the suppliers and we'd, we'd release them and we're like, Hey, hooray. We now have this new tool that you can use and nobody use it. Hmm. And like, you're not delivering any value there. You thought you were, but you're not. And so, and so in terms of like, how do you know where you're building, de delivering value and how do you know where you're not? You're looking at adoption, you're looking at use, you're talking, you're, you're talking to users, you're conducting usability studies, you're, you're, you're making it easy for them to talk to you as the founder. You know, even to this day, you know, we have 22 people that work for the company. I still do uh, user support at least a couple hours a day. And so those like balancing the, the qualitative discussions you're having with your users and just looking at the data, the quantitative data and like meshing those together. That's how you understand if you're moving the needle on delivering any kind of value or not. And the other thing too is, is, is if you're bootstrapping your business and you're using revenue as a, as a form of financing, which in my opinion is the best way to build a business, you'll know real quick if you're delivering value or not, because nobody's going to pay for the thing you're building. <laughs> Interesting. Interesting. I love it. I love it. Final question, Brian, who has been an influence on you, whether it's an author, a writer, a speaker, someone who makes videos in terms of your philosophy on, on how you flow like water moving forward and build your business? You know, I, I, uh, I love Jim Collins, Good to Great. That was yeah. a book that my dad forced me to read uh, 20 some odd years ago. And, and to me, there's concepts in that book that, that apply to business still to this day. The, the concept of the flywheel effect, 
just creating something in the middle of your business that causes it to, to have a reinforcing flywheel. And, and so for us, it's like, you know, when we when we recruit more vendors, we're able to deliver bids faster for for homeowners. And when bids get faster, they hire more often. And then when they hire more often, we recruit more vendors. And when there's more vendors, prices go down and then route density goes up and then more people want to come and use it. And it's just this flywheel. And so looking at like how you look at your business and what it is you're doing and what the flywheel looks like, like the Jim Collins, good to great is, is just a book that influenced me building my first business and now my second business. That's awesome. That That's incredible. Uh, you know, I, as an addendum to that, I lied. This isn't, that wasn't the last question. Collins, one of the, one of my favorite parts of what he write, what he writes about is the 20 mile March Yeah, where every day, and he talks about the explorers to the South pole. And one guy went 20 miles every day, no matter if it was rainy or cold. And the other guy, when it was good, he went long and they all died. Right. And the 20 mile yep. March beat him faster and lived. What's your 20 mile March? Yeah, it's, it's, it, that is another metaphor for my experience building two companies. It's that consistency. It's this the constant grind of moving forward and constantly just making small incremental uh, process of uh, progress, looking at it like a football game, no hail Mary's just constant run game. Uh, because if you're bootstrapping your business, you, you don't, you don't have the capital to make the, the long passes downfield. It's all two or three yards at a time. And so, so for me, like our 20 mile March building the first business, uh, this, this, my second business was just getting through those first five, six, seven years. It, it really, really, really was hard and, and celebrating the small victories. You know, you got to think I had my I had my first business, 150 people, 10 million dollars in revenue. Uh, I had one of the biggest landscaping businesses going in the state of Tennessee and I sold that. And then I started over again. It's like, hey, will you use this app for please for twenty seven dollars to get your grass cut, you know, begging people. My co-founders and I went door to door, hanging out like door hangers, getting begging people to use this thing. Very, very humbling. But like that was the beginning of a 20 mile march and just constantly trying to say, OK, if we can just get 100 people to use it, then I know we can get a thousand. And if we can get a thousand, I know we can get ten thousand. And if some by some miracle we get to ten thousand, I know we can get to a hundred thousand. That is our twenty mile march, and 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 it's just that consistency and that relentless uh, uh, nature of not giving up. And a lot of that goes back to your purpose. Your purpose needs to be: I want to build something great. I want to be a part of something great. I want to be successful in life, and the business is the vehicle for that. Brian, we're going to add all the links in the show notes, but people want to learn more about Green Pal. They want to learn more about you. Where should they go? Yeah. So, you know, anybody listening to this doesn't want to waste time cutting your grass. Just download Green Pal in the App Store or the Play Store, or you can go to yourgreenpal.com. Uh, anybody wants to get at me, I've been hanging out on LinkedIn a lot more lately. They've done a really good job uh, rebuilding this platform. And so, yeah, hit me up on LinkedIn. I'll be glad to, to help you out if you've got a problem in business that you think maybe my, my, my experience would help with. Brian Clayton, CEO and co-founder of Green Pal. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom today. It was an incredible discussion, not only about how you built your brand, but how to build a business from scratch, how to flow like water around your obstacles. Thank you so much. And thank you so much, everyone who joined us live today. Thanks for having me on, Kurt. I enjoyed it.